And uh, today I will give you some hints about sample preparation for flow cytometry. And I will start uh, with a general introduction uh, about sample preparation and I will give you some hints about um, how to obtain a single cell suspension from cell line, uh, a full blood or tissue. I will give you uh, some hints about sample, how to improve sample clearance or the importance of a, of a brain reach of a rare population. The second part of this talk, it will be about uh, labeling of your sample, and I will give you some hints about uh, uh, control for senior specificity. And the last part, it would be about that cell discrimination. So uh, about flow cytometry, it's very important to proceed step by step through the workflow of flow cytometry. So it's very important to obtain a single cell suspension from your starting point, that could be a cell line, a full blood, or a tissue, once you obtain a single cell suspension, you can label your cells with specific antibody, which are um, conjugated with fluorophore. Then you can acquire your sample and lastly analyze your data. So I want to stress out the importance of sample preparation. It's the first step of your workflow and uh, uh, can determine the final results, uh, the quality of your final results. So in, in this first step, it's very important to obtain not only to find out the best procedure to obtain not only a single cell suspension, but also uh, the best procedure that al allow you to isolate all the cells which are present in your sample, preserve the cellular viability, and also preserve the epitope expression, okay? So, when your starting point is a cell line, you are in the uh, kind of easiest situation. You have to collect your cells. Uh, if you have adherent cells, you, uh, trypsin or ADTA may help you to detach them. Uh, once you collected the cells, you have to wash, uh, to wash them with PBS in order to remove con contaminating proteins or debris. Then you resuspend your cells at the right concentration and your sample is ready to be labeled. A little bit more complex is the situation when you have a full blood. So uh, as, as first step during the collection of the blood, you have to choose the appropriate anti anticoagulant. For example, you can use heparin or ADTA. But if you are, for example, interested in integrins, uh, avoid the ADTA, okay? Uh, you can keep your, um, your sample at the room temperature. It's not important for a coagulation process. However, it's always a good practice to keep your sample on ice in order to avoid at least limits the mechanical stress. And as you probably already know, uh, the 95% of cells of your uh, blood is represented by the red cells. So in order to be able to study the other component of the blood, you have to remove the red cells. And there are some procedures that, that you can do. For example, you can add to, to, the, uh, to your blood the FICOL, uh, which is a copolymer that allow the separation of your cells based on density. That means that after this centrifugation, you will find that your sample uh, will be separated into different components based on their density. So you will find in the upper phase the plasma and the, and the platelets and the mononuclear cells, including, for example, T lymphocyte. And in the lower part, you will find granulocyte and red cells. So this is a good procedure if you are interested in, in platelets or mononuclear cells. However, when your target cells are the granulocytes, it's better to use another procedure. For example, you can have the ammonium chloride potassium buffer, uh, which induce the, uh, an hypotonic shock and induce the lysis of the red cells with a minimal effect on, on, on leukocytes. And I want to show you a practical example, as also in the, in the session before, they, you already saw these, these images. Uh, upon a good lysis of the red cells, uh, you are able to differentiate different population based on physical parameters, okay? So you can find the T cells, uh, the T lymphocytes here in the lower uh, part. Uh, then you can find mono, um, monocytes in, in, the, in the middle population. And the, the more complex, let's say, population is represented by granulocytes. However, when you don't perform a good lysis of red cells, this distinction is not possible anymore. 
Uh, another consideration that you have to keep in mind uh, is that when you are not able to remove, to physically mo remove the red cells, you can also uh, label your sample with CD45 antibodies and, for example, uh, re ex exclude your red cells during the analysis of your sample uh, because these cells are, CD4 are negative for CD45. Okay, what do you have to do when you have a complex tissue? Uh, you have to start with a, a mechanic dissociation that could be manual or automatic. And this mechanic dissoci dissociation will help the action of an enzyme that, have, that, that can um, remove the, the connection between the cells or disaggregate the extracellular matrix. So upon a mechanic and enzymatic dis dissociation, you can also filter your sample through 40, 70, or 100 micrometer nylon filters. Then you wash your sample and you obtain a single cell suspension which is ready to be labeled. Of course, uh, different enzymes are, are commercially available. Uh, for example, uh, one of the most used enzymes is the collagenase, uh, which is a protease that targets uh, the peptide, uh, the peptide bonds in collagen. Um, and for example, it's very useful when you, are, when you want to study the uh, immune cells, um, to, to isolate immune cells in a tissue. Another enzyme that you can use is the trypsin, uh, which is a, a serine protease. Uh, its action is uh, more gentler, but for that reason could be also less effective, uh, so be careful about that. And uh, a third enzyme, a third protease that you can use is the, is the dispase, which is less used because they, um, it can also affect the expression of uh, extracellular ep epitopes. So, um, also, about that, you have to, to be very carefully. And very important is to add to your sample the DNAs. DNAs, it's a nuclease that, tar that target the DNA, uh, which is released by dead cells and is responsible for uh, thickness. So, how you can know which is the best procedure for your sample? As I, as I already told you, different type of enzyme are, av are commercially available. So uh, always check in the literature. Uh, if you're lucky, uh, other people have already set up the, the best procedure to, to treat your, uh, your sample. Uh, for example, if you want to, to study immune cells uh, in a lung, Upon a mechanical dissociation, you have to add to your sample the collagenase type 2 and the DNAs. When your starting point is a brain, the collagenase type 1 combined to collagenase type 2 and DNAs is more effective. Uh, or when, when your sample is in heart, uh, the best um, combination is to use the collagenase type 2 and collagenase type 4 together with the DNAs. So always make uh, check in the literature which can be your best procedure for your sample. So you already, you obtain, uh, you was able to obtain a single cell suspension, but as I told you at the beginning, this is not enough, okay? You have to, to, um, to, to care about the sample clearance. It's very important to uh, avoid the, 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 the clumps formation. So for that, you can keep your, your cells and your sample on ice. Uh, you can also add to your sample a DTA in order to remove the calcium or the magnesium or use calcium and magnesium free media. You can also just immediately um, before the, the, the acquisition of your sample, you can filter your samples through uh, nylon filters. And uh, as, as in the previous talk, they said it's, it's very important to resuspend your samples at the right concentration, usually between one uh, to 10 million of cells for ml. It's, it's fine, but it's of course course, it's depending on the type of your samples that you have. Um, keep the cells uh, on ice uh, will improve also the cells uh, viability. And why this is so important? Because the, the presence of dead cells will induce the formation of clumps, increase the non-specific uh, antibodies binding, and dead cells are responsible for high autofluorescence. These phenomena reduce the dynamic range between the negative and the positive signals that may cause, uh, cause the loss of weak positive uh, samples. So uh, another point that you have to consider is how many target cells are you expecting within your starting population? I want to show you here an example. If you're 
if you're acquiring uh, 1 million of cells and your target, popul target population is 1% of the total, it's meaning that you are collecting 10,000 uh, cells, which is quite enough. However, when, you're, when you acquire 1 million of cells and the frequencies of your target population is 0.1%, it's meaning that you are acquiring only 1,000 of cells, which is, um, is becoming, that from a statistical point of view, not enough. So what you can do at this point, you can acquire a higher number of your population, but it's meaning that you are going to waste your time. It's, it's also, you can get problem about uh, blocking the instruments and, and, and et cetera. So another option that you can consider is to enrich a rare population. Uh, to do that, you can use a gradient density, for example, by adding FICOL to your sample, or uh, also isolation kits are available, which are based on magnetic beads. So also for that point, uh, check in the, in the literature. So, okay, you uh, obtain a single cell suspension, uh, you, you, your cells are alive, uh, you Im improve the clearance, so you are now ready uh, to label uh, your sample. It's meaning that you have to stain your single cell suspension with specific antibodies which are conjugated uh, with fluorophore. Different type of, of staining exist. The easiest uh, is the extracellular staining when you stain your cells uh, with, with antibody that uh, recognize epitope already expressed on the surface of the cells. Uh, another type of staining is the intracellular staining that requires the fixation of your cells and also permeabilization of the extracellular membrane in order to be able to target the cytotolic uh, protein. A third type of staining is the nuclear one, which again requires a fixation and permeabilization of your cells, but also uh, you have to permeabilize the, the nuclear membrane in order to be able to reach the nuclear protein. Okay, so um, I want to give you uh, some tips about the staining. Usually when I perform a staining, uh, I stain my sample in a small volume. Usually I use 50 or 100 microliter um, in order to prevent the dispersion of antibodies. Uh, I always stain my cells on ice because uh, in order to avoid the internal internalization of antibodies and to slow down the cell metabolism and the cell death. Because of the kinetics of binding, if you perform your staining on ice, you have to stain your cells for, that for at least 30 or 45 minutes. But be careful because some antibodies are temperature sensitive, okay? So you have to always check in, in the data sheet of your antibody that you are using, uh, whether it requires some uh, specific uh, temperature or not. Uh, stay in your sample in the dark because fluorophore can be bleached and remember to use a proper uh, staining buffer which usually contain BSA or another protein in order to limit the protein-protein interaction. As you probably already know, an antibody can also bind the cells in an unspecific way uh, because of thickness, but also because in your start starting samples uh, could be present um, like cells, uh, including macrophages, which express the FC receptor. This is a receptor for the constant region of the antibody. It's meaning that your specific antibody that you, you use for your staining can interact with uh, FC receptor, and you will obtain an unspecific signal. So how you can solve this problem? You can treat your uh, single cell suspension with the FC blocker reagent in order to block the FC receptor, and then perform your extracellular staining. I want to give you here a practical example. Uh, as you can see in the dot plot on the right, you can find, you can see a population which is negative for CD3, uh, which is a marker of T cells, but it's positive for the uh, V-beta-7 TCR, okay, which is quite, um, it's quite strange, okay? But you realize that this population is just an artifact because when you, when you treat your cells with the FC blocker reagent, this population, and then you perform the extracellular staining, this population disappears, okay? 
Uh, so uh, it's very important to add the control for signal specificity in your, in your, uh, during your analysis. And another way uh, to control for unspecific binding to FC receptor is to use the isotype control. What, what is the isotype control? It's an antibodies which have the same constant region and the same fluorophore of your specific antibody. So I want to give you here another example. Let's see in, the, in this histogram uh, in gray the signal that derived from your unstained sample and in blue the signal that derived from, your, uh, from sample stained with your specific antibodies, which in this case is F480, which is a marker of macrophages. And as you can see, on the, the, the peak on the right is clearly the positive signal, okay? But when compared to the unstained sample, also this first peak in blue uh, seems to be a positive signal, okay? Uh, when you add to your analysis the isotype control in, in orange, you can clearly, clearly realize that this signal is just an unspecific signal and you have to consider it as negative, okay? And the, only this one, uh, the, the second peak, is, is a positive signal. Sometimes you are also lucky enough that you have a biological control. So it's meaning that you have the cells uh, that do not express the marker of interest. It's meaning that in this case, you can label your sample and your biological control with the same, uh, with the same antibody, so you don't need uh, an isotype control, but you will clearly distinguish the positive signal from the negative one. And as also uh, Juzi already said to you, very important is the, uh, the FMO control, the fluorescent minus one, uh, that is very useful when you have more than three uh, fluorophore in the same mix. Because in, in this case, you can have uh, the problem of the spread of, uh, of different fluorophore into one channel of interest, okay? So at this point, you can use the FMO mix. It's a control mix, mix that includes all the fluorophore except one. And it's useful to determine the threshold for the positive signal uh, of one specific antibody. And again, I want to uh, give you an example. So let's consider the CD4 PE antibody. Okay, based on unstained control, uh, you will define as positive all the signal above this line, okay, based on the unstained control. But you cannot forget that you, in, in your mix, you have also other antibodies, the Fitch antibody, the CI5PE, uh, uh, the CI7PE, okay, that can, uh, and the fluorescence that derive from this uh, fluorophore can spread into the PE channel, okay? So how you can um, calculate or control, consider the, this, this spread, you can, oh, sorry. You can use the FMO uh, mix, uh, so you can label your sample with all the antibody except the PE antibody, and you will obtain uh, a, a, the, the signal that, that you will obtain will determine the threshold for the real positive signal of PE, as you can see here on the right. So, Another point that you have to consider, you, you label your sample, you consider all the, uh, the, the control for your analysis, but a very important is also the antibody uh, concentration. Uh, if you consider, for example, this histogram, which could be the optimal concentration that you have to use? If you look at this histogram, the right concentration is one in 10 dilution because you have to always titrate your antibodies and find the best concentration and ensure that the positive cells become, become bright and the negative will stay uh, negative. Okay, so try to avoid the first situation and the last situation. In the last situation, it's meaning that you are using uh, too much antibodies, for example, because also uh, the negative population start to become uh, bright. And in the first situation, you, are not, uh, you, you cannot properly distinguish between the negative signal and the positive one. So always remember to titrate your antibodies. It's also a way to don't waste money, for example. And your boss will be happy about that. Um, um, nothing. Uh, what happened is that you can perform, you, you now can perform your extracellular staining. Um, so you have to process your sample, you obtain a single cell suspension, your cells are alive, you perform the extracellular staining, and what happened? It happened that you have to acquire your sample, right? 
Uh, not always, because it happened that it's 6 p.m. in the evening, you want to go home. So another solution that you can find is to fix your sample, okay? Uh, fix your sample prevents, it's meaning that you are preserved the sample uh, for later analysis. Usually fixation is done in paraformaldehyde, uh, which create bonds between protein. Uh, be careful, when you have to fix your cells uh, before your extracellular staining, because for example, you have to stop uh, a cellular process, uh, you always have to check in the literature whether the fixation can alter the expression of your epitopes, okay? Um, moreover, when, you, when you, you, have, you want to fix your cells after the extracellular staining, you have to consider that fluorophore could be susceptible to the quenching upon fixation. So to, in order to limit this aspect, you, you should use a fresh PFA, you should incubate your cells for 20 or 30 minutes, and then you have to wash away the PFA with PBS, and then you can simply keep your, your sample in the fridge for three to five days. Sometimes the fixation uh, is required for later analysis, and as I told you at the beginning, uh, it's important it's required for intracellular or and nuclear staining. So, what about the intracellular staining? When you, uh, you fix your cells, you have to permeabilize the extracellular membrane in order to reach the cytosolic um, protein. In this case, you can use detergent like the digitonin or saponin, or you can also use alcohol, 70% of ethanol or methanol. Um, the alcohol uh, will um, disgregate the lipids, but will also induce the uh, precipitation of protein, so it's also responsible for fixation of your cells. So when you want to use alcohol, the, the PFA uh, fixation uh, could, it's not required. So in flow cytometry uh, and intracellular staining, it's very useful, for example, to study the T cells activation and, for example, to, to, to measure the production of interferon gamma and TNF alpha. Um, and this assay is based on a stimulation of the T cells with specific or unspecific stimuli and the blocking of cytokine secretion from the ER by monensin or, or brefeldin A. And I want to show you an example that I perform in many times in, in my laboratory, uh, where I want to, uh, to identify, to measure the interferon gamma production by the tumor infiltrating lymphocyte, T lymphocyte. So uh, to this aim, I inject, uh, I challenge the mice with the uh, lung cancer uh, cell line expressing the model antigen of albumin. Uh, seven days upon tumor induction, I harvest the lymph node. So I process the lymph node that I, I obtain a single cell suspension. I res ex vivo re-stimulate the T cells with the OVA peptide uh, in the presence of, of monensin. And then I... Um, I washed the cells and I performed the extracellular staining. So here, the, the, the gating strategy, I uh, select the cells based on physical parameter, then I select the, the CD3 positive uh, T cells, and in particular, the CD8 uh, uh, T lymphocyte. Then I fix my cells and I permeabilize the cells uh, with, um, with saponin, and I stain the sample with interferon gamma antibodies. And as you can see in this dot plot, uh, here in the, uh, the, the, you cannot see the production of interferon gamma by CD80 cells that derive from uh, a lymph node uh, of, of an healthy mice. But on, by contrast, on the right, you can clearly see the interferon gamma producing CD80 cells present in the lymph node of the, of the tumor bearing mice. The third staining that I, I, I tell you before is uh, the nuclear staining, okay? Uh, again, require the, again, require uh, the fixation of cells, uh, but in this case, the permeabilization should, it must be stronger. Uh, you, you need to permeabilize also the nuclear membrane in order to be able to reach the nuclear protein, and for example, uh, FOXP3, which is a marker of Tregs. 
And I want to, sh to show you again an example uh, of, of, an, of an staining that I perform in, in my laboratory where I want to identify the T-Rex in a tumor microenvironment, in a tumor buried lung. So again, I challenge mice uh, with lung cancer cells and 15 days after tumor induction, uh, I harvest the lung, I process the lung in order to obtain a single cell suspension and I perform the extracellular staining. So again, I identify cells based on physical parameter. I identify the immune population based on CD45 expression. Then I also identify the CD3 uh, positive cells and the CD4 T lymphocyte. Then I fix my cells and I permeabilize the cells with Triton in order to uh, be able to, to, to to label myself with the FOXP3 antibodies. And as you can see in this dot plot here, I use the FMO as negative control. And on the right, you can clearly see the T-Rex uh, present in, the, in a tumor buried lung. So um, I give you some hints about uh, how to obtain a single cell suspension, about labeling of my samples. Uh, the last part of this session is about that cell discrimination. So as I, as I already said at the beginning, uh, the, the dead cells will create a clump, uh, the clump for, are responsible for clump formation, increase the non-specific antibodies binding, and are responsible for out of high, high fluorescence. So based on physical parameter, you can uh, exclude the debris and the background signal, as I, as I already showed you. Uh, however, this is not meaning that you are also removing the dead cells present in your samples. So uh, you can physically remove the dead cells, for example, by a density gradient, by adding FICO to your cells, or you can also use the dead cells removal kit, which are uh, based on, on magnetic beads, uh, or you can also use a fixable or not fixable dye. For example, if you are, if you are interested in, in studying apoptosis, uh, you can label your cells with annexin-5 and the 7-NAD uh, dyes. Uh, annexin-5 uh, will bind the uh, phosphatidylserine, uh, which is normally present in, inside the cells, but during apoptosis start to be expressed on the surface of cells. Uh, 7-NAD is, in, is um, a DNA, uh, a dye which binds to DNA, which is excluded uh, by the live cells. So this means that your live cells will be neg both negative uh, for 7-NAD and for annexin-5. Uh, your apoptotic cells will be positive for annexin-5 but, but negative for 7-NAD, and your dead cells will be uh, double positive for 7-NAD and annexin-5. What is a, a limit, which is a limitation of this labeling is that these dyes are not compatible with fixation. So a, a solution is to use the uh, fixable dyes which are commercially available. Uh, these are dyes that bind to, to the protein. It's meaning that also live cells will be will became bright. However, the dead cells will be brighter. And as you can see in this dot plot, you can clearly distinguish the live cells from the uh, more brighter dead cells. Okay, so this was uh, the, la the last slide of my talk, and uh, I hope you that I, I was able to give you some hints. Uh, an aspect that I want to um, underline is to check, always check in the literature, uh, which could be your best uh, uh, solution, because maybe your, your, um, your question is already there. And uh, nothing, I want to thank uh, all of you for your attention, and I'm now open to some questions.